Um, so, uh, so I think to some extent it's worked for him a great deal over time, but in this particular case, I'm not so sure it's working for him at all. I saw Bruce was here, but he, uh, I think he sort of popped out. Anyone have any other thoughts they want to go over? We're going to start with the you know COVID first, and then the VP debate uh, afterward. And uh, have you ever seen a bug sit on a man's head for so long and him do nothing about it? A lot like he went full Norman Bates. Yeah, I was. You know, like. Uh, what the hell happened there? I, have, I, I do think it's so, I do think it's just so funny that in contrast to the presidential debate, this one was so bland and uneventful that the most prominent story was a fly. And that's people are going to look at Mike Pence now, regardless. And every time they see him, you're just going to think of that little bug in his snow white hair. The hashtag pink eye Pence was also trending because every time he looked over, it looked like he had pink eye or some type of like burst. I, or like conjunctivitis or something. Yeah, I was like, I was looking at it, I was like, what is that in his eye? So I don't know if this is true or not, because uh, I didn't have time to check it, and it probably is not true, but some people were tweeting that um, pink, eye, pink eye could be a sign of COVID, okay? In like 11% of the cases or something, it happens. Okay, Obviously. you check that out, uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, it says so far, based on data, that one percent to three percent of people with COVID get pink eye. So, I mean, those are low numbers, so you can't figure that he has it. But still, um, it, it was I, I I noticed that too. I noticed that even before the fly, and I wasn't even sure it was a fly. I thought something dropped on his head because it was sitting there for so long. I mean, how does that happen? Does this fly have karma or something? It's like. You know, um, it's like... I think Jeff said, I think it was Jeff who said that it was stuck in the hairspray. Um, that no, that was not uh, Christina. I said <laughs> that uh, flies are attracted to shit. <laughs> All right, well, I don't know if you want that on the WSA feed, so... No, no, I'm not, I'm not going to say that on air, but I mean, it's true. Uh, if I say something about it, I'm, I'm going to tone it down, but like was my immediate thought when I saw it. All right, folks, so look, uh, we got about four minutes. I'm going to hit the uh, old man's room, and everybody else uh, use this time to, to uh, do it, and uh, then we'll fire it up, OK? And Bruce is laughing, so I know I hit a nerve on that comment. I'll be right back. <laughs> slow couple of weeks. <laughs> What's the funniest fly meme or whatever that you guys have seen? Send it to me. The Norman Bates stuff. Or the really? The Biden yeah. campaign put out a fly swatter and it says like truth over flies on it. Hold <laughs> <laughs> out. Yeah, he bought the domain and now like the link uh fly will boat will take you to I will boat. I don't know how he did that so quickly. So funny. <laughs> they were too quick with that. Like they must have saw that and were like, go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> By what? By a, by the fly swatter. It's like already sold out. I guess a lot of people thought. Oh, you're kidding, really? Yeah, look, I'll put it in. Oh, okay. I'm calling it hashtag flygate. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Okay. I know Kamala Harris is also being turned into a meme for her facial expressions, like her side eye that she kept giving Pence the entire time. She um, she smiled. She 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 smiled too much. It, it looked fake. It was like, um, they must be the same coach Joe Biden had. Why are they smiling? I, I thought she was more effective when she looked serious, when she looked pissed. I feel like that was like good of her though, because
and she kind of has this way of like being really direct and like not like I don't want to say condescending but like really on point about stuff but like doing it in a way that's like nice and doesn't make her seem mean or like nasty or yeah that's I, I, I just personally I just think that's so unfair you know that women have to be in this box especially if you're the first it's not just women you know I, I just think minorities are period there's a script you've got to abide by. You know, she's afraid of being seen as the angry Michelle Obama. You know, the angry black woman. Now, I mean, I I, I, I like the tough side. It's a tough job. It's a tough business. Uh, I don't want you. I don't want you to be like the men, but it just come on. She's a prosecutor. You know, she's, she's a tough politician. Uh, that, that smiling thing. I just thought it looked fake. But, I mean, that's just me. So, actually, that's, uh, you know, so I had the VP debate second in line, um, just because COVID still has to be the big story. But uh, I do want to pursue that whole issue that you guys were just talking about. And you'll see that yeah. that's, you know, that's uh, part of it, um, of what we talk about. So, um, Good. any other final thoughts, comments before we roll? All right, so we're going to start rolling. Let me just hit record. Okay, well, welcome everybody. It's October 8th, and we are just uh, 26 days before Election Day. Um, welcome to all of the WUSA viewers and everybody else out there. Um, lots to talk about. Uh, it seems like every week uh, we pack in about a month or an entire campaign season worth of news, uh, and it's no different uh, this week. So I want to kick it off um, uh, talking about the president and his COVID diagnosis and what that means. Then we're going to talk about the vice presidential debate, what happened last night, and discuss and process that. And then we'll talk about a few other matters, time permitting. So I'm going to pop up a uh, PowerPoint here and uh, just I'm going to sort of frame the discussion right now with this. Okay, so again, 26 days to the election um, and we are ready to roll in the final stretch. Everything got upended with the diagnosis of the president getting COVID uh, last week and you see the president leaving uh, Marine One uh, heading to Walter Reed with his COVID diagnosis. People gathering around Walter Reed Hospital. Prayers for Mr. President, four more years. Um, uh, you see the, the president uh, not willing to accept that he's sick and not willing to accept social distancing protocols. And uh, in this famous, now famous ride around uh, uh, Walter Reed, this is what we saw. Unable to hold his rallies, unable to have that energy coming from the campaign, he decided to uh, uh, ride around Walter Reed and then return to the White House earlier than many uh, physicians thought was necessary. And here's what happened when he was at the White House uh, in this famous scene on the Truman uh, balcony. Taking off his mask. And then you see the White House put together a video of the commander in chief in charge and doing well. It was that image of strength that the White House wants to portray because to the president, if you are weak, you are a loser. And the last thing he ever wants to be seen is as a loser. He wants to be strong. He wants to be seen as in charge. He wants to be the one who's triumphant over COVID as he's been triumphant over his critics 
and his enemies for years. And this is how he is spinning the narrative of him getting COVID. Here is uh, Kelly Loeffler, senator from Georgia, in one of her ads about the president and COVID, uh, uh, sort of uh, using a wrestling video of, uh, of Donald Trump vanquishing uh, Vince McMahon. And then you see uh, Representative Matt Getz, President Trump won't have to recover from COVID. COVID will have to recover from President Trump. And there is an image that they use that had to be taken off uh, Twitter of the president sort of in football gear triumphing over uh, COVID. This is the image that he wants to portray. And then he basically says it's less lethal than the flu. Flu season is coming up. Many people every year, sometimes over 100,000, and despite the vaccine, die from the flu. Are we going to close down our country? No, we have learned to live with it just like we are learning to live with COVID in most populations far less lethal. Um, and uh, then he goes on and um, his team basically says that this is actually an advantage for him because he has an experience that Joe Biden doesn't have. Well, firsthand experience is always going to change how someone relates to something that's been happening. The president has coronavirus right now. He is battling it head on as toughly as only President Trump can. And listen, that of course that's going to change the way that he the way that uh, he he speaks of it because it'll be a firsthand experience. He talked about it all. And listen, he has experience as commander in chief. He has experience as a businessman. He has experience now uh, fighting the coronavirus as an individual. Those firsthand experiences, Joe Biden, he doesn't have those. Joe Biden doesn't have the firsthand experience of COVID. Therefore, the president understands it better. Is the message in all of this? Perhaps his most Famous, famous tweet was this one when he was uh, uh, about to leave Walter Reed. Don't be afraid of COVID. Don't let it dominate your life. To which you saw many responses on uh, online. Um, this on Instagram from Amanda Klutz, wife of the actor Nick Cordero, Cordero, who did succumb to COVID earlier this year. And, you know, let it dominate your life. No one's letting it. Nick didn't let it. It wasn't a choice. And it dominated his life. It dominated my life. It dominated our family's lives um, for 95 days. And, be and because he didn't make it, it will ever affect my life. Even if he would have survived, it would have forever affected and changed our lives. It's beyond hurtful. And, and have some empathy. Why are you bragging? Have empathy to the... Americans, that you are our leader. Have some empathy to the people who are suffering and grieving. And that went viral. So I have a question for all of you. Did the president misplay his reaction to COVID? Did he do it well? Um, are there things he could have done or should have done uh, that he didn't do? Um, is this going to hurt him? Is this going to help Joe Biden or is this going to help him? Because as uh, they say, he now has experienced it so he can understand what other people are going through. So let's uh, just start it off. I'm going to start from the top left of my screen. Just remember this order, all right? I'm going to go Jenna, Dan, Amelia, Jeff, Stephanie, Andriana, Robin, Manuel, Christina, Amrutha, Maddie, and my gosh, Ryan, Riddy, Chloe, Anya, and that's what we have so far. So why don't you all start it off, and if you remember that, you're better than I am. Go for it. Okay, I will say that I think the way he's handling his diagnosis is probably not the best choice. Um, I know he's appealing that semblance of strength and not weakness to his support base, but as we've kind of noticed and we've discussed in past sessions, his support base is actually a very narrow, small margin of the American electorate and the American voters. And you mentioned how like he's portraying this strong image because he sees like his weakness of being sick as losing and he doesn't want to be seen as a loser. But by, by doing that, he's kind of making this deadly virus into something like a game where losers 
are people who die, but it's not a competition. And it's almost mocking people who have died with COVID and who have lost people to COVID. And that video you just played shows how this is not a game. There are no winners or losers. These are lies that he's gambling and making fun of. And I think that, yes, he is right in his tweet. We have to learn how to live with this deadly virus um, because it's not going away. We have to learn how to manage our daily lives around it. Um, But it's not like the flu. It's not like an illness where we have a vaccination for it. And yes, you can contract it, but ultimately we know how the recovery process goes. We know how to get people better, like get better. Like this is not something like the flu. So I think that among independents and people who are still for some reason undecided in this election, it is kind of alienating them and pushing them more towards the Biden campaign who is showing or giving off that air of really taking this seriously and not making it into a partisan issue of Republicans or Democrats. It's an American issue. And I think that both Kamala Harris and him in the past debates have been really pushing that this is an American issue and that they're going to put out a health plan for the American people. And I think that after how Trump has been acting, after his diagnosis, has been really more appealing to independents or people who are undecided um, than his era of strength or brushing it off as it being just a light, common thing that he caught and can be cured with an experimental drug that he was given. So I think those are some good insights to suggest that um, people shouldn't be dominated by this uh, disease almost implies that those whose lives have been dominated because they've lost loved ones or been seriously ill are in effect losers. And this fits a pattern. For example, if you remember his comments about John McCain, uh, basically in effect being a loser for being caught in Vietnam. Any sign of weakness means you are a loser and that sends a strong message to people who are suffering at this moment and trying to deal with it, notwithstanding the fact that everyone wants to sort of resume normal life again. There's nobody who wants to continue this. That's not the issue. The issue is how you deal with the pain and suffering of a country, and did the president miss an opportunity on this? And one other point, and we talked about this before going on air, is that the president has basically said he's not going to uh, participate in this next debate because the commission on presidential debate said that uh, it's going to be virtual. My hunch is that when Joe Biden, who did say he will participate, the president will say he's scared to be in person with me, therefore he is weak, because part of the president's whole theme about Joe Biden has been he's weak and feeble and frail, and the president is the one who got COVID, so he has to compensate for that by suggesting he wasn't the one who was weak and frail, that he's the one who has strength. So my hunch is you will see that narrative carried out more when they have this debate over the debates in the coming days. I think it was Dan and then Amelia next. So that was a really great point, Jenna. I love the points you made about um, specifically Donald Trump playing with people's lives, playing games with people's lives. One thing I wanted to say that made me think of, so earlier this week I heard the phrase that the health of the president is a national security threat the health is in danger, and I totally agree. To that point, I'd also like to add that what Trump is doing is he's becoming a threat to national security. He is spreading coronavirus, and I think that's also something that just as equally as his health is a national security threat, he's endangering the lives of everyone he's coming into contact with by not maintaining social system while still being positive for coronavirus. And I think it's just really upsetting one thing that I think that his response showed, I said this last week, is that Donald Trump is an elitist. He's an elitist. He's, he doesn't relate to the people. He had so much better care, medical care options, than the majority of Americans did. And I think that it's also really interesting that he praises a, a program at Walter Reed Hospital when his... Uh, commentary on socialism and socialist ideas are so heavy because the medical care he received was a product of socialism and socialist policies. So it's just, 
hypocritical and interesting to see because it shows that he's not one of the people and it's surprising because his supporters love to chant like oh like we don't want elitists while upholding an elitist so i think that it's just really kind of showing i think that independents can see like he's not one of us he does he's not he doesn't have the same experiences as me if i went into the hospital with coronavirus or any other illness we wouldn't have the same care and yeah i'll leave it at that so basically what you're saying, he's receiving government-run health care, um, which is the finest in the world, uh, and he ridicules that uh, as well. And you're also saying that, uh, and I think this has been a concern, look at the number of generals and top military and national security people who have been quarantining because of their potential um, uh, sort of contact uh, with the Trump White House right now, and therefore it's a national security concern. Again. I think we can't forget, though, that a lot of people do want to resume daily life. And I do think that the president is trying to tap into that, that sentiment that he is going to be representative of a country that doesn't want to be sort of stuck in this lockdown and is trying its best to be able to break through that. Now, whether he's done that inartfully or not um, is another question, but I think that is what they are thinking strategically that there are a lot of people who are just don't want to be in this sort of social distancing lockdown phase and he's trying to represent it. Whether he's shown the proper empathy or not, as Amanda Klutz suggested, is a whole different issue. Um, but he may be appealing to his base, but as you both are saying, he may be losing independents who want somebody more with a soul to think about the people who are suffering. Amelia, it's your floor. Um, yeah, so I was just thinking about the video that you had put up, and I think the woman spoke to Zoom, the press secretary of, what was it, the Trump campaign. Um, I think that she had a point. I think that it could have been that way. I think that Trump could have had an advantage over Biden had he been like, yeah, I've been through this, and I can relate to the other 200,000 people who have lost their lives and also their families. But instead of like connecting and trying to be relatable with this experience that so many Americans have suffered from, He's kind of saying, like, see, I've been right all along. Like, you know, um, we, we don't need to change anything. Like, this isn't a big deal. And I think that's an important point because he's one person who doesn't like to be shown that he's wrong. So to him, his recovery vindicates his whole approach, assuming it's a recovery. It vindicates his whole approach all along. Um, that we can overcome this, we can handle this if we have the will and fortitude and work through it because it's in the best interest of this country not to see our economy crash and to do as best as we can to be able to go out there and accept the risk that exists. Of course, the very fact that people are dying and people are suffering in our health care system is overloaded right now is a drag on the economy and the fact that people don't want to catch this illness is a drag on the economy. So you can't wish it away, but I think that's part of it. As soon as it was disclosed that he had it, and assuming that he was going to get better, I was on radio, and I said one thing. Um, Bill Clinton, for all of his faults, one of the things that made him a popular politician was that whole sort of phrase that he was associated with, I feel your pain. It was a sense that he could walk into our lives and understand the lived experience of the American people. Um, and uh, as Dan said, the president could be one of us if he had shown that empathy or that experience. And as Amelia said, he had that opportunity, but I don't think he took advantage of it. He could have done that and still pursued his message, but by sort of closing off the option of suggesting that I get it, I experienced it, I may have been near death, I want to work with every family to make their lives better and to see how we can uh, sort, of, uh, uh, sort of ease their pain and difficulty. I am there for you. But he didn't do that. And I think that was a real missed opportunity. So who is next? Was it uh, Jeff? Yeah, I'm going off what you said, assuming he's recovered. I, I think they are, you know, jumping the gun a little and saying he's fully better from this, that video of him coming back, you know, that was the course of a weekend he got treatment. And from what we know, COVID just doesn't go away in a weekend. And we saw from him there when he was up there taking his mask off, he looked like a guppy out of water. 
So, I mean, I don't know that he's fully better from it. I don't know that we can trust everything the White House is saying regarding to his health on this. But, you know, let's go back to the issue of him having it. Um, this was certainly an October surprise, maybe, you know, not the one he wanted or was talking about. But he had this chance to connect to the American people. He knows his support base, 36 to 40 percent of Americans are ride or die with him. As he says, he could go out to Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and they'd still vote for him. They would regardless of his response to this. What he needed to do in this moment was reach out to some of those independent voters, some of those Republicans that are going to vote Democrat this election, and say, I've experienced this. I understand what you're going through, and we're, you know, listen to the science, wear a mask, let's follow the protocols, and let's get this under control. Because if I can get it as arguably the most powerful man in the free world, you can get it too, and this is serious, and this is something we need to get a hold of, and he just blew it by having that have this show of extreme strength and beating it in two days. Yeah, and um, I think you're also right that uh, it's unclear what his condition is. He's been taking steroids, which may give an artificial sense of energy right now. I know people who have had COVID, and after about five days, they say they're okay. And after about eight days, they're going to the hospital um, uh, because it's an insidious disease in so many ways, and we're not still sure how, uh, how to deal with it. Um, but uh, yeah, from now it appears that he's okay, but again, you can't know that. And a little footnote here, it just came out this morning. Um, do you remember when the president went to Walter Reed to get checked up, uh, I think it was last fall? Um, he had all of his doctors, anyone know what he had them sign? Non-disclosure agreements. Um, and two doctors refused to sign it, and they were basically taken off his case. Um, so again, uh, he, you know, it, it was an issue that came up in the debate last night, which we can certainly talk about, which is how much should people know about the president's health? Um, and, uh, you know, is this something that should be far more transparent? Or are there national security reasons not to disclose some of that? Any case, I think, Stephanie, you were next, right? Um, I feel like the president's response worked well to continue to polarize us, um, at least with the cohort that I keep, that I talk about politics with. Um, his response to him having COVID was incredibly frustrating and how he used that narrative to be like, yeah, don't let it dominate your life when it has dominated our lives for six months. So I feel like we, my cohort who stand as like never Trumpers, don't vote for him, don't support him, were frustrated, but then seeing that video which was alarming to me of that supporter who was willing to die for him and like verbalize that and have that like inciting that like undertone of violence to it of being like if you hate Trump go, come through me first that was scary and I think that that's something that I witnessed Trump do over the past few months with this campaign we keep talking about independent voters but I don't think he is trying to attract independent voters anymore. I really don't think he cares about them. Um, I think that he is staying true to his base and why he's doing that, I'm not sure, but it has this undertone of violence. I feel like he just wants to hype up his base so much to the point that perhaps if he loses, um, his base could act out as a result. Well, I so Lenny, uh, Jeff, let me, um... Let me just interject a couple of things. I, um, I'm, I'm going to disagree with both of you in terms of, quote, the president blew it. In his mind, I don't, I, I don't think he thinks he blew it. He, he put on, you know, his production piece uh, all the way down to, you know, standing on the Truman balcony, you know, the salute, you know, at the networks were closing their shows. We were in a box. We had nowhere else to go. So that's the image that was embedded, you know, in everybody's minds at the end of the newscast. Uh, and, and I agree with uh, Stephanie just now. I, Donald Trump, the only the, the only weapon he had for expanding his base was, you know, improving the economy. He was rolling there for a while. Uh, all of those Republicans out there who won't say it publicly but privately will tell us they just can't stand this guy. You, you know, they think he's toxic. Well, you don't have the economy. Um, 
you, you don't have that group. And so, you know, um, COVID-19 took away the economy. Donald Trump played the only cards he had. I mean, he couldn't come out and say I was wrong about COVID-19 and be humble and I'm in this with you because that would be an admission that he's been wrong all along. And I ask you guys, when has Donald Trump ever admitted that he was wrong about anything? So what is he doing now? He continues to play to his base, uh, 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 trying to get him excited. But, but his other move is to suppress the vote. Talk about the mail-in ballots. You can't trust them. He continues to uh, uh, you know, court those groups, uh, 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 the, the supremacists and others, until he's in a box and he absolutely has to say what everybody wants him to say. So I think Donald Trump at this point sees what most of us see, the numbers. And uh, uh, Biden's numbers are such that this won't even be a close election. And so now it's like just hold on to your seats and, and count down these days and hope we can get to the election and get it behind us. Uh, what I'm dreading right now is what happens in those days that we've got left because anything can happen. I, I, I think we're looking at a, a desperate president. The notion of him being in the Oval Office while infected borders on insanity. And the reason we know he's in there is because the Marine Guard is stationed outside the door. That is the sign, president in the office. I think that is reckless behavior and that is just more of him playing the only cards he has. I'm strong. I'm in charge. I was right about COVID-19. Everybody knows. But when you think about it, that reckless behavior will turn off, as some of you have said, the independence. Um, but Bruce, as you say, he's playing to his base. And Stephanie, you point out those supporters. And what, what, how does that all relate? Well, um, the president uh, has, part of his political genius is to have his supporters identify with him as if to defend him is to defend their own life. It's a form of self-defense because they are so fused together in terms of identity, in terms of culture, in terms of sort of a, a grievance against perceived elites who uh, uh, allegedly look down upon them. And so what I think the president is doing is counting on his base to turn out in such large numbers in those battleground states that any attack on the president is an attack on them. That's what he made it into in 2016. And if he pairs that with any efforts to sort of either frustrate mail balloting or suppress uh, the African-American vote as what happened in 2016, which I have some clips on later, then they're thinking of a calculus that regardless of what the polls might be saying, if turnout and lower turnout on the Democratic side are paired, then potentially he might be able to thread that electoral college needle. So he may be doubling down on his base strategy and thinking that if they turn out in such large numbers, if rural voters in Wisconsin and Iowa and the northern part of Michigan um, and Ohio and Pennsylvania turn out in large numbers, then he has a chance to win those states, and that may be enough to be able to make sure that he's reelected, regardless of what the polls say and what the popular vote is. So I think there's an element of strategy in there, but it's based on this psychological relationship that the president has with his base, which is that their lives are fused with his fate, and therefore any attack on him is an attack on them, and they will go to bat for him. Who, who is next? Was it uh, Robin or Andriana? Go for it. Yeah, um, I think everyone's just touched on a lot of points, but it's going to be hard for me to like touch on all of them as well. But I will do my best. Um, so I agree with everything being said about his supporters and Trump's not actively trying to appeal to independence anymore. It's very clear. Um, in 2016, this bravado and this very masculine um, portrayal of strength and just I do what I want and that's how it's going to be, um, I think had broader appeal because, um, like you were saying, of the economy. And now that that's gone, people are much less willing to tolerate him. Um, and so I am worried about Trump's tactics to win now, because I don't think he's just going to give up, and I don't think he's just going to accept the fact that he's losing or um, being defeated, because that's just definitely not the personality we've seen in him. Um, and we can already see these like voter suppression tactics being put in place. Um, for example, so I'm from Houston, Texas, and Texas has recently instituted a rule to only have one um, drop-off ballot station per county. 
um, which means that counties like Harris County, which has Houston, which has 4.7 million people, only get one um, drop-off station for their ballots. And in comparison, Houston has more people, or Harris County has more people and is larger than Rhode Island. Um, so imagine having only one drop-off station per state. Like, that's crazy. Um, but that's what's happening down in Texas. Um, so we can already see these tactics being put in place um, to help him try to continue to beat Biden even when the polls are not in his favor. Um, and he's trying to rally his supporters, not only, I think, so that um, the stuff you saying maybe because of violence, but maybe just if he loses, his supporters just won't let him leave the office. They're going to cause so much of a disruption in the political process and political system um, that it's too chaotic for him to just be simply um, the losing president. It has to go to something bigger. So that we can see a lot of concerns um, in Trump's strategy and Trump's face, even when the polls show that he's losing and even when his strategy with the coronavirus, which was very insensitive and very um, inappropriate in so many ways at so many different points in this whole process. Um, is not appealing to anybody except his strong, strong supporter base. Um, I also just wanted to touch on the continued GOP perspective that he's so strong. You know, oh, look, Trump's so strong, he absolutely demolished the coronavirus. Oh, Trump's so strong that he's beating it when nobody else, like so many other people couldn't, which is so disgusting um, to imply. Um, but I just wanted, you know, is he so strong? Would he have survived COVID if he was a regular middle-class citizen? Would he have survived COVID if he was lower class with no health insurance? Would he have survived if he was an illegal immigrant? You know, there are so many different factors that are inconsiderate to say, and it's con con continuing to project the privilege that Trump and so many of the GOP refuse to recognize our presence in um, government and in the wealthy class. I mean, last night Pence wouldn't even recognize that there was unconscious bias in the police force or that there was systemic racism in America. So we just continue to see this ignorance from administration in terms of empathy, in terms of um, classism, in terms of racism, in terms of everything. And it's very disturbing, it's very disrupting to see. Um, and I think a lot of America can see it. I mean, we've seen how the polls have shifted in the last week, but like we were saying, that doesn't necessarily mean everything's smooth sailing for Biden, um, which is what makes it such an interesting election, this 2020, because any other election, I think, you could say we're kicked back and you can kick back and relax and just wait and see what happens. Um, but we can't do that right now. It's much too tense. So, so um, from the perspective of his base, um, uh, the police are the good people in America, and they don't see themselves as prejudiced or bigoted. And so, uh, and to them, Complaints about prejudice or bigotry are just people who haven't really been able to pursue the American dream, and it's on their shoulders. So, in effect, um, he's speaking from a different perspective that his base is coming from on these issues. So, you can say he's out of touch, but he's not out of touch with a large chunk of Americans that he's expecting to be able to vote for him. And if he were to acknowledge unconscious bias, if he were to acknowledge severe problems with policing, if he were to acknowledge that there's systemic racism in America, it would violate all of the messaging that he's been communicating to his base and potentially lose them and their passion for their sense of grievance uh, in, 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 as the elites telling them how to feel and telling them what to say and telling them how to think. So this, again, reinforces the notion of these parallel universes that we have in this country. The problem, as you point out, is that he, he's been hemorrhaging those independent voters, okay? So is that base strong enough to be able to get him over the top? Because you just can't seem insensitive on all of those issues, including COVID, and maintain that sort of suburban independent vote that you really need to be able to win this election. So again, you say he's out of touch, but he's not. He's in touch with about 40% of the country, um, uh, but that just symbolizes the incredible polarization that we are feeling right now in the United States. Robin. Yeah, um, if I only 
watched Fox News, and that's the only news organization I would watch, I would think without a doubt that President Trump is the strongest, the best president this country has ever had because the way that they frame him time and time again on their station. They show clips of him just like protruding strength and um, like waving his fist and just, you know, making the U.S., talking about the U.S. as if, as if it's the only thing that matters in the whole entire world. And his followers, his the are uh, the Fox followers, the medium age is um, 65. Those people are taking what Fox News says, doesn't you know fact check with another news organization, and takes what they say as fact. And those are his followers that will never doubt him or never question Trump's message or anything like that. And I think that if I only watched that, I would have no doubt but vote for. For, for um Bi or not Biden for Trump because he just the way that they talk about him the seriousness that they talk about him is just so extreme and and the way that they talk about ballots and mail in ballots is it's scary it well the democracy is is in the hands of, of young people that don't know what they're doing and these people are so afraid of voting and they just frame everything as this is like the choice is Trump or death, basically. And I think that that is doing a good job of keeping his supporters on his side. And like my conservative family members and friends, they're like, well, did you see what Fox says? And I'm like, no, because they're rooting for Trump. And I am not going to vote for Trump. Uh, and I'm not going to allow a media organization to sway my opinion because they are friends with him or whatnot. And I think that Fox is his number one supporter and Fox followers are his number one supporters. And it's scary because the media, as we've mentioned before, is supposed to be unbiased, but they are doing just the complete opposite of that. And I think that if his followers continue to watch Fox, especially, you know, with a couple weeks until the election, that, that they're not going to be swayed whatsoever to vote for Biden or even just leave or not vote at all against uh, Trump and Pence. And it's not only Fox, it's the entire media, media ecosystem echo chambers that we're in. We've been siloing in our communities to live around so-called like-minded people increasingly. If you look at landslide counties around this country, those have grown and increased over the past four decades. We are gravitating to communities that share our values and that the median attitudes in communities in America are shifting more left and right depending on which community that you're in. Um, and so you're seeing congressional districts that are D30 or R30, Democratic 30 plus points, Republican 30 plus points. And then you've got Facebook, particularly with the algorithms that ensure that people receive posts and information that are only consistent with what they may want to see. So Facebook becomes this sort of magnification of what you're talking about because people are only exposed to the particular types of information that the algorithm suggests that they may want to be uh, exposed to. So we are reaching this point through media, through our geography and community, through social media, in which people are only hearing those particular things that they want to hear. And look, we have one of our teams discussing partisan media in all of this, and the echo chambers are on both sides to some extent. I don't hear a lot of liberals giving Trump credit for infusing billions of dollars into a vaccine program um, uh, that might accelerate the, you know, a vaccine faster than other situations. Wouldn't it have been nice for somebody to say, yeah, you did that, that's good, but it still failed in terms of your overall response to acknowledge something that he may have done and not just to condemn everything that he did. So I think everyone is falling into this situation where nobody is being willing to acknowledge anything good that the other side may do, and that furthers the polarization. But I do agree with you, Robin. Fox has been driving this for 20 plus years and that and talk radio certainly deserve a lot of the responsibility 
for the siloing and polarization going on in this country. So who is next? Anyone remember? I think it was Manuel. Okay, go for it. Yeah. So I've been seeing this quote online a lot during the past couple of weeks, and it's that the good thing about science is that it's true, whether you believe in it or not. Donald Trump didn't believe in it, and he saw, and he's experiencing that it was true. It was not like immigration or climate change or even racism, where he could choose not to believe in it, and it wouldn't affect him. He didn't believe in COVID. He downplayed it, and now it's affected him. And I don't think anyone is surprised that he contracted COVID. It, I, if anything, I think we're surprised that it took so long. He has just been holding rallies with thousands of thousands of people. He's been acting like this problem has been done and dealt with, when in fact it hasn't, and we have 200,000 people dead. And of course, Trump being the strong man that he is, now that he contracted the virus, rather than to acknowledge it, what he does is to further downplay it, something that seemed impossible a couple of weeks ago. Like, how could he further downplay this threat? And yes, of course, his health is a national security threat for obvious reasons, but I think that the real threat at hand is his attitude towards the diagnosis. I think that's the real public health uh, issue that we are going to be facing in the coming weeks. And now, the problem is that he has given his supporters and people who believe that this is a hoax ammo. He has given them ammo to say, hey, the president got it and he's fine. Well, I got COVID back in March and I didn't have the luxury of choosing that it wouldn't affect my life. I spent a room, I spent a month in a room and I think other people in this class have had also gotten COVID. Millions of people have gotten COVID who haven't had the treatment that the president has had, who haven't had the resources that he has had and haven't had the option of saying, eh, I'm not going to let it affect my life. That is just so completely and blatantly ignorant. And the sad thing is, is that people don't see it that way. His base doesn't see it like that. They see it as more of a reason to support him. And it's just so indignant. Like, how can you not let COVID affect your life when you lost your job? How can you not let it affect your life when you can't go to school? I personally am not receiving the same type of fruitful experience doing online learning, but I'm doing it because it's what we have to do. We've all made sacrifices on a day-to-day -day basis. And now the president is just like, eh, I don't think that applies to me. And that's just so inflammatory. And again, I get that there are partisan divides. There have always been partisan divides, but this, I think the sad thing is that people are just feeding into the politics of this rather than just seeing it for what it is. If I can piggyback on what uh, Manuel's saying here, uh, and I'll just give you one group. Let's look at Florida. I, I, I think most observers, and Lenny, I think you're going to agree with this, if Trump loses Florida, it's all over, okay? One of the groups that he did very well with in Florida were the seniors. I mean, he cleaned Hillary Clinton's black when it came to seniors in Florida. Well, he's lost that group now. You know, Biden has made incredible gains in seniors. And keep in mind, with what Donald Trump has been saying, you know, about, you know, COVID-19, early on he was saying, look, if you're not a senior, if you don't have some pre-existing you know, health condition, this really doesn't affect you. Well, he just turned off a big part of his voting block from 2015 when he said those kinds of things. And his recent response in the last week, you know, to COVID-19, has only just further alienated that group and probably seniors in a lot of other places, Pennsylvania and some others, but certainly in Florida. I think uh, the last poll I showed, he is really losing, you know, the seniors in Florida. It's, it, they're just leaving him in droves, and that's a big deal. Again, I come back to Donald Trump's base alone isn't going to get him anywhere, and I think he knows that. One of the things we haven't mentioned just far, uh, thus far, he was counting on a vaccine, okay, with those independents and those Republicans, you know, that, that still may be leaning or giving, giving him a look. Well, that's almost taken off the table now. So he doesn't even have the possibility of a vaccine, maybe by the end of the year. End of the year is not good enough. Whatever Donald Trump needs to happen, it has to happen by November 3rd. And it may already be too late for so many people voting, you know, through the mail. So, and early voting. So again, Democrats, those who seem to know what they're doing and know the mistakes that Hillary Clinton made, they seem pretty confident right now. And barring some major international, you know, event or something that really causes the country to rally around the president, regardless of who it is, a lot of Democrats are feeling pretty confident. This race is over. 
So your point about the vaccine is an interesting one. Um, and Manuel, when you were talking about science, it made me think that it's very much a part of um, Western and American tradition to think that we can tame nature, that we have the power to be able to overcome it. As a, the most technologically advanced country in human history, we believe that we can bend rivers, tame nature, do anything we want to make progress serve our needs and our will. And to some extent, um, the president, by pushing the vaccine, which I'm glad he's doing um, in, on an accelerated basis um, uh, in terms of, of funding, but by pushing that, it fits in with that very American and Western mold that we can defeat things through science and technology, even if he's defying science at the same time. Um, and his whole approach that he can be stronger than COVID fits in with that very American sense that we can do whatever we want to nature and make our lives better. Um, it's a very 19th century and early 20th century perspective that he's fitting into, but as to some extent we've talked about in this class before, the president has this very 1950s view of what our country is and ought to be, and has sort of rejected those cultural frames uh, from after that time period. But if you look at what he's doing in some funny way, he's basically doing it in a very traditionally American and Western sense, which is we can define nature, we can get things done, Technology can solve things, and we will be better at, uh, in the long run by doing it that way. But again, a pandemic doesn't necessarily apply to that framework, but he's trying his best uh, to be able to make that uh, his storyline. So I think, um, Rutha, you were next, right? Oh, no, it was Christina, sorry, go ahead. So to go off of Dan's point earlier and um, Manuel's point, to say that President Trump has experienced this um, virus as any individual is completely false. He continues to attack um, socialized medicine, but you know the care that he received was 100% government funded, government run, and not everybody has that access to health care. You know, so to say that is just completely ignorant of him. And honestly, if anyone knows this individual experience and this typical American uh, dream, it's Joe Biden. And I think he's really pushing that narrative, you know, being from Scranton, Pennsylvania and, you know, working his way up in politics. And, you know, if, if you look at his tragic personal life, he knows grief and he understands the families who have lost um, loved ones more so than any politician. And I think if Biden continues to play that narrative and really, you know, show the American people that he knows their pain, unlike President Trump, who, you know, was able to go back to the White House only a few days later um, after receiving all this government funded care, I think that's really going to play to Biden's um you know, fighting space, and it's going to persuade those ind individuals um, who are undecided and those more um, moderate Republicans. And also to um, go off of Stephanie's point earlier, I think Trump is definitely playing that fear factor. I mean, to scare Democrats and independents from voting. I mean, we saw in a rally um, that Trump held that he's calling his base be pool watchers, um, you know, so he's calling his base to basically scare people out of voting, which I think it could work. And that's completely horrific. But yeah. So let's uh, take that one point for just a second. And then we'll move on because I just want to show you all something quickly about um, the president receiving government run health care. Um, he obviously knows that he made a mistake uh, by suggesting that we should not, that, that his administration won't participate in any negotiations for government support for people who, you know, for the stimulus and for people who have been suffering because of COVID. So let me just share this screen with you for a sec and to play off of this. So um, 
the president rejected stimulus talks. Um, wait, hold on a sec. Let me just do one thing. Yes, okay. So the president rejected stimulus talks um, and basically said he's not going to participate in that. And then uh, 24 hours later, he basically says, uh, no, I'm, I'll, be, I'll agree to stimulus checks uh, that can go out to people immediately and billions of dollars for the uh, airports and pay, paycheck protection program for small business. So he obviously understood that he was receiving the best of care um, and that, that that shouldn't be reserved for him alone, government support. And then yesterday, he goes out in front of the White House and does this. I want everybody to be given the same treatment as your president, because I feel great. I feel like perfect. So I think this was a blessing from God that I caught it. This was a blessing in disguise. I caught it. I heard about this drug. I said, let me take it. It was my suggestion. I said, let me take it. And it was incredible the way it worked, incredible. And I think if I didn't catch it, we'd be looking at that like a number of other drugs. But it really did a fantastic job. I want to get for you what I got, and I'm going to make it free. You're not going to pay for it. It wasn't your fault that this happened. It was China's fault. So is he trying to correct um, sort of the record on this by realizing that uh, if he sort of squeezes the government aid to people, yet he received government support for his own health care, that it's not going to send the right message, that he then backtracked on his initial rejection of stimulus talks, and that he's now talking about Americans receiving the same drug uh, treatments that he got free of charge. Is, it, is he recognizing it, or is it just too late, and he's just sort of lost this, and this is a desperate attempt to try and understand that the American people have been alienated by his approach to all of this. I'm Rutha. I think that, and to the point I was going to make earlier too, I think it all ties in is that when the president was first diagnosed, what everybody saw from the White House was panic. No one knew how to deal with this. They had they were panic trying to get into the hospital. They were they had no messaging in place for how to deal with this whatsoever because. They didn't think it was going to happen to them. And so I think now what you're also seeing after the fact is they're just disorganized. They don't really know how to deal with it. So whether or not he has recognized that he needs to backtrack on this, whether or not he is seeing now political consequences and trying to make up for it, I think what everyone is going to remember is just the initial panic coming from the White House, the chaos that was happening, not knowing what the president's condition is, not knowing what doctors are saying versus what Mark Meadows is saying. I think that that image and that organization, disorganization is what's going to stick in the minds of people moving forward, regardless of how much he tries to backtrack, regardless of what they try to do after the fact, that was chaos. And I don't think that anything they do after that is really going to be able to erase that. And that also brings up an interesting point, because some people are making parallels between this election and what happened in 1980. If, uh, if Bruce will remember well, 1980, the hostages in Iran, the American hostages. And in, in 1980, Jimmy Carter tried to put forth a rescue mission in which American helicopters basically crashed in the sands of the Middle East. And the whole notion of incompetence and chaos in the White House began to emerge rather than calm and reasoned and measured management of a really bad situation. On top of that, the economy was crashing. We were heading into a recession. We had 15, 16, 17% interest rates. It was a total mess. So what you're saying, I think, is very important. People want a degree of competence in the White House. That's why they were giving the president credit with the economy, whether it was because of his policies or not, but it seemed like things were going well. Um, so, to some extent, you have a message of incompetence, chaos, that sends a strong message that people don't want in Washington, D.C., and I think you, you hit it on the head about why a lot of those independents, that and the empathy issue, may be hemorrhaging right now uh, from the Republican Party, and this could have down-ballot implications, too. Who is next? I think Maddie. Maddie B. Yeah, I would just agree 
agree with Amruta that I think that this backtracking on the stimulus is really closely linked to uh, sort of the conversation around how he dealt with his COVID diagnosis. I think we saw him sort of struggle and which is sort of common to him is this inability to show strength while also showing empathy. I think there was a way to do it. And I think we sort of saw that in that stimulus talk, but his failure to do this early on is really what might uh, hurt him with those moderates and independents. He hasn't been able to sort of reach that nuance. And we've seen this in, in multiple cases with sort of like we talked about earlier, uh, calling troops, uh, suckers and losers with uh, John McCain's death. I think that this is where he really struggles. And Donald Trump is overall a really good communicator, but where he's failed is his inability to sort of capture the nuance of a situation. And a lot of the times that benefits him. It makes his arguments really, really tight, really easy to understand for a broad audience. But I think in situations like this is where it really struggles and it might lose him those Modern independent voters, those suburban voters, also I think a lot of women um, who are sort of, as we've talked about before, looking for that sympathy element. And nuance in politics comes about when you understand the lived experiences of others and you listen to people and hear them and understand that their experience may be different from yours. And obviously one of the criticisms of the president is that he projects his own issues onto everyone else and doesn't have the bandwidth to be able to listen to a lot of other people beyond those who want to support him and who are loyal to him. And I think, you know, you lose nuance if you don't listen and if you don't expand beyond the particular uh, situation or base that you're in. Who is next? Was it Ryan or? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I guess just to, uh, yeah, go off the stimulus talks. Um, yeah, I think the Stimulus talks, probably ending it and also doing it in a way that basically lets Congress off the hook, um, I think does support the idea that Trump is no longer really interested in, uh, you know, appealing to those like independents and people who reluctantly uh, voted for him in 2016 because of like his economic, uh, you know, message. Um, however, as far as like this sort of narrative about the sort of like authoritarian kind of like tactics Trump could use to utilize like the system like voter suppression to like win the election. Um, you know, I do want to say that like at the end of the day, it is still like, you know, he, it is an election that will be you know, at least free, at least in some cases. Um, and he will need, you know, electoral politics to win it. Uh, so I think where the polling is now, and also, you know, when you hear comments like, you know, he's losing these crucial voters like independents, like suburban women, you know, I think that is like sort of like the signs of like death blows to the campaign that is like, frankly, really relying on some like Hail Mary, some outside event that will just come in the next couple of weeks to take Biden. Uh, right now, I just don't think there's any like thing that like the campaign could do like with their own means, like with their own strategy uh, to sort of like change the course that the uh, election has taken. So once again, base votes in large numbers. Remember his uh, tweet saying that he was not going to participate in any uh, stimulus negotiations was coupled with an accompanying tweet saying they were going full speed ahead on the Supreme Court nomination of Amy Coney Barrett. So again, playing to his base uh, and uh, caring about that. So his, his strategy, I think at this point is base votes in very high numbers, so distrust in mail-in balloting, expect chaos in mail-in count, mail ballot counting, um, and potentially use whatever strategic advertising they can to um, make some of the uh, voters, particularly minority voters, Latinx voters and African-American voters, not vote at all. In other words, be swing voters between voting blue or not voting at all, rather than necessarily voting for him, put all of that together, he's thinking he can maybe hold on to Arizona, hold on to Florida, notwithstanding what Bruce was saying, and pull in one of those Midwestern states, which is all he needs to be able to win the electoral college vote if everything else stayed the same as 2016. 
I think that's really this strategy right now. And then, if he wins the Electoral College and loses the popular vote, to say what he said in 2016, that that was rigged uh, and that he really should have won the popular vote. So again, I think everybody is right here, but and it, to me it's very clear that this is a base strategy on steroids, and it's not just the steroids that he's using to make himself feel better right now uh, with his COVID. Who was next? Was it Chloe? It was Riddy. Okay, go go for it. Hi. Um, so just a few thoughts based on what everyone's saying, kind of similar. But the first reaction that I had when you showed that video of a man um, saying he would die for Donald Trump is that he might have to, um, which is scary, but be true um, based on his reaction to COVID and his unwillingness to protect those around him and putting others at risk and the public through his actions. Um, and I think that COVID actually is really scary and should be treated as a serious reality, but it undermines his strategy to not uh, to treat it so and doing pretending that it's not real has been consistent with his messaging, but has demeaned the 210,000 people who are dead due to COVID. Um, and it is hurting him with the many families who lost someone due to COVID. Um, and I think that's definitely harms his hopes with suburban moms or um, suburban women and families who have lost anyone due to COVID. So he is appealing to his base and I'm sure it is working with his base, but appealing to his base isn't enough. Um, and more so he's putting others at risk and saying like, by saying that he doesn't want to add additional strict regulations to a potential vaccine or by saying that he doesn't want to hold a virtual debate. These are all signs that he really only cares about himself and his base and not the American people. So what about all those business owners or bar owners or restaurant owners who say, if I don't have people come into my business or store or restaurant, that's putting my well-being at risk. That's potentially jeopardizing my life and my family's health and our security and the lives of my children. Um, you know, isn't he also playing to that? Um, you know, uh, in other words, are there is he basically sort of following that narrative versus the narrative that you just laid out? So answer me on this one. Re rebut me on this one, Riddy. Um, I do think that he is appealing to certain people, and I do think he'll be successful, but I don't think it's enough. Um, and you can't, well, at least specifically for Donald Trump, you can't win the election with just his so it won't, it's an effective strategy, but not effective enough. Okay, so in other words, it reaches certain people, but not enough to get him over the top. Who is next? Anyone remember? Chloe. Yeah, um, I think what I wanted to talk about is very relevant to your clip, um, but I think in this class and it, overall in the campaign, we've talked about how well he is, at, how good he is at reality TV. That's his background, that's what he knows. Um, I think this is where we see that, that strategy and that skill start to fade away from him. Um, because with reality TV, what he is really good at doing is building a brand. Um, and I think Natty B brought this up, but he is very good at communications, but communications has different, you know, like different parts of communication require different skills. Like journalism is different than PR, is different than reality TV. He is so focused on the reality TV strategy of building a brand and building a certain character around himself and his supporters that he's forgetting he's not there anymore. He's not in that world. He's running a political campaign against someone who's very skilled um, and who isn't hated by most of the country the way that Hillary Clinton was in 2016. Um, so I think what's happening in the tweets and in the video that you showed is him forgetting that the brand doesn't matter right now. What matters is in this like highly sensitive era that he needs to like be a leader um, and not a villain in the reality TV show um, because villains do get popular um, in reality TV shows, but they don't get popular in American politics for the most part. Um, but yes, that is it. <laughs> And to follow up your uh, point, um, 
reality TV gets big audiences in its first season or two, and then the audiences start to diminish, and it's only the core supporters of that show, the core viewers that stick it out until the show is canceled. So, it, you know, the, the persona, the brand can be fascinating and titillating and everything else right up front because you're curious what's next, but when you've already seen it, it may wear thin. And in this particular case, people may be expecting more, which is pretty much what all of you are saying right here today. Who is next? Anyone else? All right, Dan, and then we're going to pivot to the vice presidential debate. So I kind of wanted to answer your question, or kind of back up Ray's point about the small business owners. I really like that question of small business owners being like, well, what am I going to do? And kind of as a rebuttal, I kind of wanted to point out that Donald Trump is playing politics with their lives, with small business owners' lives, by delaying the stimulus check, by allowing COVID to continue and not taking it, well, not taking it seriously. Yeah, you might lose business from people not being allowed to go into your restaurant, but COVID infection, infection of all your staff, your infection, your hospitalization, having to shut down your business and sanitize it, that's definitely more damaging than closing down or only doing takeout. And I think that that's also really important. And I think that if we're gonna acknowledge Trump uh, or Trump wanting to reopen small businesses and ignoring the virus, we should talk about the effects of the virus, we not might, but will have on those businesses. We should talk about how Trump has delayed what would help those small businesses flourish while funding his own. Yeah, I think um, what you're saying reminds me of, I think, one of the big problems in American politics is we often, too often treat things as a zero-sum game. You know, if you win, I lose. If you lose, I win. I think a leader in this country would try to figure out a way that everyone can try and win out of this thing um, and to make everyone feel that they're in this thing together. Um, and so how do you do that? Well, that's what leadership is. It's not oh, if you don't support small businesses, then you're against small businesses. No, it's what you're saying. Small businesses want to thrive, they want to do well, but they also be could become super spreader places that could not only ruin their business, but the people, the patrons of their businesses. And so we have to figure out a way to not to politicize every single aspect of this virus. And unfortunately, I think that's the space we're in. So bottom line, what I'm hearing from all of you, basically, is that we have or are reaching a potential tipping point in this election. That the president may be able to count on his base, but he's losing anybody who even was going to consider voting for him because of his response to COVID. And that may be one of the reasons we're seeing some of these poll numbers move in such a very stark direction toward Joe Biden these days. The question then becomes, did the vice presidential debate help uh, the president out or did it help Joe Biden out? Let's talk a little bit about the VP debate and I'm gonna pop something up here um, on this. So the VP debate last night. Um, I'm gonna raise one big point that I think really needs to be talked about and we touched on this before uh, class. Mr. Vice President, I'm speaking, I'm speaking. Um, you see these tweets. When Kamala said, I'm speaking, every single woman felt that. I'm speaking. Men love to speak over women all the damn time. Kamala said, not today. From Mashable, the headline, within minutes of the debate, Kamala Harris reminding Mike Pence, I'm speaking is every woman in a meeting. And here is what she said. The president wanted people to remain well, let's go. Right. No, but Susan, I, this is important. Susan, I, and I, I, I want to add, but if Mr. Vice President, I'm speaking. I'm speaking. In. So, um, is this part of the reaction right now among all of these women voters? We are seeing a remarkable hemorrhaging of women voters from President Trump. Donald Trump lost the women's vote uh, overall, not white women, but he lost the women's vote by 13 percentage points in 2016. 
Um, he is now, his unfavorable rating at, among women in this country is as high as 57%. There was a sense uh, from Time Magazine, uh, I quote them, of condescension and contempt by Mike Pence toward Kamala Harris, a sense that he was lecturing her and sidestepping the moderator's question, um, and he was refusing to heed his time, notwithstanding what the moderator, a woman, was trying to do. Um, and uh, is, is, is this one of the takeaways from this, or am I just being too sensitive here and suggesting that uh, uh, reading too much into that interaction? So I'm going to go in reverse of my screen this time. So uh, Andrea, Zach, Riddy, Chloe, Ryan, Maddie B, Amrutha, Manuel, Robin, Andriana, Jeff, and Dan. And if you guys can remember that, you're better than I am. Did I miss Maddie M? Uh, I think I might, might have missed Maddie M. So Maddie M, I think you are, uh, are up there too. So I'll get to you all. So let's start it off. Um, so I don't necessarily think that you are reading into it too much. What I do believe is that um, you may be reading into it in a slightly different way than what I think um, actually was occurring and what it leads to. Do I think that this was necessarily um, after a push of a lot of women with the bourbon women to start supporting Biden? No. But do I think that this can help um, women, particularly suburban women, start supporting Biden? Yes. And I think that what was actually um, occurring was Senator Harris finally having this opportunity to speak up. Um, there was more policy in the VP debate than I think Biden had said in his entire campaign trail, um, which is impressive. And I think that this is her chance at finally speaking up against this very patriarchal system where women, especially in politics, are not allowed to speak and are constantly being spoken over. And I think this is kind of her putting her foot down and saying, no, I'm going to be respected. I'm going to be listened. I am an equal party in this debate. I am, my voice is just as important. It should carry just as much weight as any man's voice. Um, because there was also other parts, not just that one video, but other parts where she similarly had to lecture him, had to kind of teach him and how to interact with other people and how to look at policy and how to look at the history of the United States. There was that, for me, that one very powerful moment where she said, you know what, let's have a history lesson and let me teach you. Um, and I think that it comes from her voice as well as millions of other women before her and in her time being silenced and not giving this space and platform. And I think that she was using it to her benefit while there are things that I think that she could have continued and proliferated um, while having this platform, yes. But did she do a good job of kind of representing herself and of sticking up for herself? I think that she did. There were definitely times where I found that um, she could have pushed it a little more um, and really pushed the boundaries when asked about the Supreme Court nomination. And she focused entirely on the Affordable Care Act. and. The Affordable Care Act had already been talked about. She had already talked about it. I think that would have been a perfect opportunity to talk about um, women's rights and LGBTQ rights, which would also be at stake um, with the nomination, or also are now going to be at stake with the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett. And she should have used that time and should have used that platform as a female. Um, but otherwise, I think that she did a very good job of telling the people and the audience that she is here, she's going to be loud, and she refuses to be silenced, and she is going to be heard. I think she was definitely uh, unflappable and trying to deal with somebody who was talking over the moderator and talking over her repeatedly. Uh, I, if that were me, I might have pushed back more, but she is in a bit of a box because as a woman, if you push back too hard, you're not seen as strong or decisive, you're seen as aggressive. As an African-American woman, if you push back too hard, you're seen as angry. So I think she really had to walk that sort of tight wire of how to push back on those interruptions and that talking over 
without coming on too strong because she understood the biases and the prejudices that exist that are often unconscious in terms of how people interpret uh, events and interactions like that. So who is next? I think it was Zach. Okay. Um, yeah, I said I think that the main thing is from the different reactions that we're seeing from um, Harris's performance. You know, while we're all on the same page that you know, basically, she is like many women in politics, constantly having to struggle to break through loud and wrong men talking over them. Um, I think that the we have to remember that there are still people who will side in a completely different direction. Just to give an example, like Charlie Kirk, the director of Turning Point USA, as soon as the debate started around like the 9.30 mark, he tweeted that Mike Pence is winning decisively and Kamala Harris comes across as condescending, bitter, and angry. And I mean, that there is an example, a textbook example of misogynoir, which is anti-black sexism. And it, to me, I think that it's the fact that people are so divided on whether or not, you know, even Kamala had the validity that she had. Um, when I think that the truth of the matter is, is that she right now in every single way is having to posture um, this strength and that she's having to constantly break through. And I think that the issue for me is that when you look at American politics, um, a large issue is that black women continuously stand on the left and leave the left. Um, and the truth of the matter is that the voice, their voices are very rarely ever heard or very rarely ever considered, um, I think, presidential. I think it's the fact that right now she is the vice presidential pick to another old white man when she is obviously, she's in a place that I think a lot of younger a lot of more, um, I, I want to say less engaged, but I'm pretty sure there's still a lot of people who are very engaged, who stand on Kamala's side of why at this point are we still tailoring strategies on the left to sort of match Donald Trump's chaotic energy. I think that right now people are looking for someone who's very able to just sit through um, what's happening and articulate it in a way that I think exhibits a kind of eloquent rage because we are mad. A lot of people are upset in this moment right now politically. And we are upset that we're having to constantly argue with people who is, are committed to misunderstanding so that they can continue to benefit from their own political gain. And so I think that that is what I'm seeing. That for me was a big thought that occurred while I was watching the debate that this is history in the making. And yet the people on the stage are acting as if, you know, now is the time to really continue the political theater that we've seen in the last month. And I so let, me, let, yeah, uh, let, let, let me jump in here. I um, had a couple of thoughts. You know, as somebody who, who was raised by, you know, an African-American woman, my mother, been married to an African-American woman for a long time. Um, it, it's so unfair. Uh, but being a minority, being the first, you know, woman in this case, uh, who was also, by the way, auditioning last night to maybe one day be running for president, as was, you know, uh, the vice president. It's just so unfair that she has to fill all of the blanks, you know, in terms of our expectations of this woman. Bottom line, I thought some of her strongest moments were, were when she showed some emotion, uh, 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 some anger, some frustration. Uh, especially in light of who's sitting in the White House right now. So let's not talk about decor and how you're supposed to conduct yourself. All that's out the window now, you know. She had to display last night, number one, that she was incredibly smart, which she is, incredibly accomplished, which she is. I mean, imagine being prosecuted, you know, uh, you, you know, in California. But that, that she was confident and capable of uh, taking over that job as president if need be. At the same time, we're talking about and we're worried about, you know, is she coming across looking like the angry black woman? If anything, I thought she smiled too much, okay? I thought, I thought she smiled when it totally wasn't necessary, like Joe Biden, smiling when you're not necessary because you're trying to not show, you know, maybe another emotion. I wanted her to be herself. 
Uh, she is in that position because she's earned it. You know, she has her, as much right to be there as the guy sitting next to her. Uh, he's the one that I had a problem with and that he kept talking over her. He kept talking over my incredibly competent, smart colleague, Susan Page. Kind of like, I'm here, I'm in charge. I will say what I want to say, and when I'm finished, I'm finished. I started to turn him off. And I'm telling you, I'm trying to be objective about this. I look at these kinds of things in the performance in the show. If anything, I, I felt she held back too much. Uh, I, I think she gave him a pass too many times. Uh, and while I got the floor, the one area where I thought she just totally let him off the hook, she didn't talk about what's happened in the last several days. You know, what's going on, you know, in the White House, in the Oval Office right now. A, a president who has the disease and, and holding court. You know, uh, the, the entire you know, Joint Chiefs of Staff, you know, they're, they're on leave right now for the most part, or at least working from home. So she let him off in a lot of areas, but this whole notion, I go back to Michelle Obama, that she's afraid or we're afraid that she may look like the angry black woman. I think maybe we need a little anger from the women. I really do. I think we saw some of it in the, uh, the midterm. I think we need to see it, you know, this time around. I want to hear more from the angry women, not the women trying to fit into this box that men have put in there. The, I sort of agree, if there's a reason to be angry, people should be angry. Uh, it was Ronald Reagan who mastered uh, the ability to channel anger into indignation. Um, and the question is, will the indignation of a Kamala Harris only be interpreted as rage without the eloquence that Zach was talking about? And I think this is something that goes through, was going through her mind and that they were thinking about the entire time was to make sure that it's not at all misinterpreted and giving people a reason not to vote for her and for Joe Biden. Um, as James Baldwin uh, once said eloquently, and I'm going to completely uh, uh, paraphrase, that history is not something we read in the books. Um, it's alive in us every day. And I think she understood how history is alive in us every day. And that's why she had to, I think, overcompensate to make sure that that ugliness of history didn't come back to hit her. In an ideal society, Bruce, yes, you're right. But we're not in an ideal society. And so how do you process that being the first on that stage trying to deal with prejudices, conscious and unconscious, in terms of how you're going to be interpreted. That's why I think, yes, she dropped the ball on a lot of issues, but the fact that she was able to maintain her composure by being interrupted and, and being talked over um, was uh, itself an accomplishment and a feat, given how much she was carrying on her shoulders in this regard. So I think she just had a very, very difficult challenge, and she dealt with it, a, you know, fairly well. I wouldn't say perfectly. I thought she did very well. Just, just one more point. When she made the point about of all the federal judge uh, judgeships appointments that the president's made, uh, absolutely none of them have been, you know, black. I said to myself, and I thought it was a great point, and I thought that was where she, she, she really showed some emotion and how this had hit her, not just professionally, but, but personally. But you know what I immediately thought? Some people out there are saying to themselves, there she goes playing the race card. You know, there she goes playing. And that's what she's up against, okay? I thought she did very well, except for those she smiled too much. Let them have it. Yeah, I actually thought the exact same thing when she made that comment, almost the exact same thing. Again, understanding the context and the culture and the history that gets poured into every single moment. So let's right. uh, continue on with this. I think Maddie M. Uh, had her hand up, and I, I want to make sure you get it. And then I think, was it uh, Riddy? Were you uh, coming up soon, too? All right, go for it. I'm just going to kind of echo what everyone else has been saying. I thought that Kamala did a great job. She had a tough task of balancing, trying to get out the Biden policies, and also fact-checking Pence on his. I mean, the man is a great debater. He was successful in deflecting a lot, and a lot of times went on undetected by the American people. Um, when he was asked about Roe v. Wade, he flipped it on, are you going to pack the court? And it automatically transitioned, so I thought that she did a really good job, you know, to your point of being smiley, being happy, being calm, because he's very calm, as we saw yesterday in class, very eerily calm. 
and getting angry. I mean, she counted down, listing all the ways that as her DA position had helped her, and that was something that was really tough for her because it it um, gets her a lot of criticism for her past as a prosecutor, and she did well in terms of kind of getting ahead of the jump, and I thought that was really impressive from her, her taking the argument away from Pence in terms of that. Yes, Pence is a very effective debater. Um, and as you say, he deflected a lot. It often didn't go noticed. Uh, he is effective. And uh, you got to give him credit for knowing how to work the media, work the sort of answers. Um, whether that was effective for everybody or not, again, that's unclear. But I think what he needed to do was to reassure any of those independent suburban women that the Trump administration is in charge, they're doing their job, they're competent, they're accomplishing things. And even though he tried his best in his answers to do that, by talking over women, he might have undercut what he tried to accomplish with this debate, which is exactly what Andrea was saying earlier, which is uh, it may have made people who were at least open and uncertain move them a little bit more toward Joe Biden simply because of his behavior toward women uh, in this particular debate. Who is next? I'm trying to think. Uh, Riddy, go, go for it. So um, I have sort of a controversial opinion, and I will explain it for it to make more sense. But um, so I've seen this quote everywhere, the um, I'm speaking quote, and I think that it is highly relatable, especially for women. And I know that women who attend male, do who have careers where that are male dominated and they attend these meetings, in their career, they struggle to make their voices heard. So I think that she's def like her experience is definitely realistically something that women go through. And I think she stood firm to make her voice heard. And that was a challenge presented to her as a woman. And there was an additional need to prove herself that shouldn't exist, but does. But I will say, and a lot of people might disagree with this, but I don't think that she was discriminated against for being a woman in terms of Pence's words and him interrupting her, because I think that's just the strategy for the Trump-Pence campaign. Um, we saw it in the presidential debate, and Joe Biden is very clearly a man. Um, and I think that's just what they, how they operate what they do. I don't think it was because she was a woman. Um, but I do think she was scrutinized to a larger extent. And she proved that she's someone who won't stand down, which I think is very important for her to establish. And I do agree that she showed like great power in the debate, which was awesome. I fully supported it. She established her credentials. She focused on creating a connection with the American people by making direct eye contact with the camera, which I thought was very powerful. Um, and she did it in a way that wasn't dominating the conversation or cutting off the other party, just as Pence cut her off multiple times. So I think she did a good job in the debate, but I don't think she was discriminated against because of being a woman in terms of Pence and the way he talked and his thoughts. And you may be right about that, um, but it's also not necessarily um, the intent, but the takeaway. And if the takeaway is that he talked over not only Senator Harris, but the moderator, both women, um, uh, that's what people might take from it, whether it was the strategy regardless of who was on the debate stage or not. So again, this may be less intent. It may be unintended consequence which then goes along the line of potentially alienating a constituency he needs. She also perfected the way he shook his head all the time. What was that phrase? Anyone know the phrase of how she responded? Her side eye, OK? Um, and everyone's talking about how she perfected that side eye um, of, of looking at things. And that got a lot of notice uh, as well. Who was next? I'm, I'm losing track. Uh, was it Chloe? Was it? OK. Um. I have, I guess, so I think that her debate strategy was also the reason that she was chosen to DDT. It was to balance out Biden's, you know, brand and demeanor. Um, he's seen as someone who, and has been painted as, at least, by the Trump campaign as someone who's weak, who's feeble, who, like, will not fight back. Um, and one thing that the democrats do really well is identity politics um they know picking candidates who reflect people that they want to attract sometimes work it doesn't always work because people of color aren't stupid um but by picking 
which is horrible, but by picking someone who is a black woman, who is educated, who like can speak for herself and can do that thing where she said, I'm speaking, I'm speaking. I think they did that on purpose um, to balance out that image of Biden. It is horrible that they're using a stereotype to win a campaign, but I think it's effective and I think it's working. Um, and her performance yesterday was great because she had that balance, because she has had to have that balance her entire political career. Um, otherwise, she wouldn't have been even on the stage during the primary. So I think she did very well. Um, but I think part of that is she had to, to balance out Biden, who um, in his debate want, needed to be more colloquial and casual. And that's why he tweeted that thing in response to the fly. And that's why he could say he called Trump a clown. And that's why he said, uh, why can't this man just shut up? Um, he needed to do that. Harris, on the other hand, needed to show that she's educated and professional, but also willing to fight back and fight back because that's what a strong woman is. Um, but she also needs to be restrained because of everything we've been talking about. So I think everyone, this is the Democrats playing what they are very good at lately, is, which is identity politics. And I think it was effective, especially in this debate. Although with Harris, if you remember sort of into ancient history over a year ago, um, a lot of people were saying she could have been the most formidable candidate against uh, President Trump. They saw her as a very strong candidate before, even before the debates. The Republicans were very worried about her, regardless of any, you know, any uh, issue of identity politics. Uh, the perception was that she had the capacity to be a very strong candidate, but it's rough business running for president. I also noticed in the chat real quickly, I can't pay too much attention to it, but um, somebody said that what would have happened if she had said what Joe Biden said, if she had said to Mike uh, Pence, shut up, man, would that be the story after the debate? If she had said, shut up, man, would you think that would have been the story? Yeah, okay, yeah, that's my guess. So, so again, she had to have that restrained notion that she doesn't have the liberty to do what Joe Biden did. Joe Biden got dinged a little bit for that, but not seriously. Um, just imagine if when Mike Pence was constantly talking over everybody, she had said, shut up, man. Nobody would talk about anything else this morning. That would be it. That would be the headline. That's what everyone would talk about. Who is next? I think it was Ryan. I know, Zach, you're trying to get back in there. I'll do my best to get you in, OK? Um, yeah, so I think uh, just something else that um, I thought would be more prevalent in this debate um, would be uh, age, and that is that both uh, candidates on the stage last night uh, are considerably not only younger than their presidents who they like serve under, but also um, you know a lot of like the sort of top tier of uh, you know American politics with like Clyburn, uh, Pelosi, McConnell. It's kind of shocking to me, at least, especially how much like, you know, the U.S. kind of values like youthfulness and, you know, being young or perceived as young. How like a lot of these people in like their late 70s and 80s have sort of, um, you know, remained in these like positions of power and like, you know, of, like they're out in front of with the public. Um, and I think there was one question about it um, during the debate, but I just thought that it would just be a larger like part of it or at least be mentioned a bit more just you know that they are like younger you know uh that sort of like i guess appealing to that sort of like you know passing the torch kind of thing um and i just you know i was kind of surprised not to see it and i think that's also a good point because if you remember some of the ads we saw yesterday about harris it showed her energy sort of that vigor that vibrancy um, I think what's being communicated through the Biden ads about Harris is that youthfulness um, that she brings with her, that energy. Because you're right, we now have a gerontocracy in America. Um, you know, the president in his mid-70s, the candidate who may, uh, the Democratic candidate will be 78 if he's inaugurated president. The three Democratic leaders in the House are either 80 or right there about. The Republican leader in the Senate is in his late 70s. 
Um, you know, we don't even have useful 60s in the leadership anywhere. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think that's a good point, but that sense of energy that she shows and that Mike Pence had, um, those do potentially resonate. But it's one of the reasons why I think, to go on Chloe's uh, uh, point, it may not just be African-American woman, it could be that youthful energy that becomes a, a, an alternative uh, vision when Joe Biden says he's a transitional candidate and the transition is to somebody who does represent younger generations more. So I think that generational issue is something that's important. Um, I'll let Zach go in and then we'll go to Maddie B. Okay, um, and to that point, I guess what for me keeps coming up is then what, why, where, where, who said that we need to wait then, right? Like, who is saying that there needs to be some kind of smooth transition from Donald Trump to Joe Biden to Kamala Harris? I think that whether or not you believe she was discriminated against for being a black woman, the truth of the matter is, is that even how this conversation is going out in our class reflects the dynamic that people are saying is a problem in our politics. Women face an incredibly hard double standard that does not make any sense. You know, like we, uh, well, you know, people are constantly talking about, well, Democrats only care about identity politics and this, this, and that. But isn't that exactly what won Trump the presidency in 2016? So we, we are constantly having the same conversations, I think, and we're trying to find a way to really connect what is the present moment to the past so that we can learn from it. And I think that that is what Democrats are still struggling to miss and still struggling to actually, um, I think, learn how to incorporate more more um, collectively into the party. Um, Zerlina Maxwell, she wrote a book called The End of White Politics. And in it, she makes a really good argument that the Democratic Party should embrace identity politics because ultimately, that is what is rallying people in our elections in the year 2020. Like, it is becoming a more effective strategy for actually empowering and inspiring, especially young people to vote. So why, why are we sitting here asking ourselves, you know, like, if Kamala had told Donald, um, by, um, Vice Prince, what is his name, Mike Pence to shut up, then how could that be wrong? Or like, how would that have been seen? I mean, who knows, but also who cares? We should be a little bit more concerned with the fact that she is an incredibly um, talented and very qualified woman who could probably be president herself. But instead we're having to face with the fact that we're still dealing with what I brought up in a previous class was these really old rules or these really old unwritten rules that I think need to be thrown out. In the long run, um, I, what you're really saying is that even though it's important to embrace identity politics, it ultimately shouldn't matter um, because any, everybody should be treated equally uh, on the same plane. But I think you make another important point, which is that... Um, well, I don't know. Actually, I don't think I'm saying that identity politics, that it all just matters. I think that what I'm saying is, is that there is a clear equivalent on the left. If the right is able to use identity politics to rally all kinds of fringe movements and push someone to a presidential candidate. Why is it so bad when the left says, okay, you know what? We have a black woman who's about to be vice president. That within itself is an exciting notion enough. Can that not be what we carry the platform on? Or does it continuously have to be this, okay, well, Kamala should have to tiptoe here and there and this, this, and that. And I think that a part of political leadership is embracing when the status quo needs to change. And that is what I would like to see as a young person. Yeah, she shouldn't have to tiptoe. That's the whole point. Um, and, uh, and I think you're 100% right. Identity politics is often associated with only the progressive side of the political spectrum. But Donald Trump has played identity politics extensively. Um, it's one of the reasons why he refused to denounce the Proud Boys or what he said in Charlottesville. Um, or why his focus has been primarily on white working class voters or white rural Christian voters or such. So, um, yeah, identity politics is part of politics. I mean, when you look at constituencies, you're looking at identities. 
you're looking at religious groups, ethnic groups, age, all of that stuff, uh, where you live, how you live. Suburban women is an identity, and that's an identity politics. The question is, in the long run, it shouldn't matter, but if one side is going to do it, why is a double standard held against the next side? And I think that's a very, very important point that you're making here. Uh, Maddie B? Yeah, I just want to start off by saying to Zach's point, the fact that we are having this conversation about Kamala Harris last night and not asking questions about Mike Pence do just sort of highlight the fact that everything that Kamala Harris did last night was scrutinized so heavily. Um, and I think that it's important to recognize that. And then that's also being seen in media coverage, I think. And one of the things that I think has been interesting to watch in media coverage is that we're seeing sort of like a highlight on Twitter and stuff like that of these moments where uh, Kamala Harris spoke up and was able to be like, no, I'm speaking, and these sorts of things, which are very poignant, very important, inspirational at some level. But what really stood out to me last night was the moment in which, in which Mike Pence succeeded, in which Kamala Harris and Susan Page both were constantly trying to get him to stop speaking, and he just didn't. He was able to speak over both of them. And you could see Kamala Harris had sort of run out of those prepped things that were available to her because those were the things she was allowed to do to keep this moderate constituency vote. And I think that that was really frustrating to watch as a woman and to watch a woman of color go through that and figuring out how, how to play that role. Because as much as the Trump campaign has sort of focused their messaging back around their base and really, really focusing in on that, we've also seen the Biden campaign really focusing in on this moderate voter. I think to reach that voter, Kamala Harris has even stricter guidelines sort of that she has to follow as a woman of color in these situations. Yeah, and look, um, it's, it's what everybody has been saying at this particular point. There is an extra burden and there shouldn't be. And that's the whole point. So you play with the reality, you deal with the reality, but in an ideal situation, as Zach seems to say, you shouldn't have to be able to do this. You should just be who you are and let it roll and show exactly what you think and what you feel at that moment and not have to restrain yourself for fear that certain voters might react in a certain way. That Lenny, Lenny, you're all right. This is an incredible conversation here. But just go back a few years. Barack Obama you know, wrote the textbook. Michelle Obama wrote the textbook in terms of, yeah, it's not fair, but it is part of the burden, being a minority, being the first. If you look back in history, not just politics, but sports, science, anything you want to talk about. The first always had Jackie Robinson in baseball. Let's do our history here. The first always, number one, you got to be exceptional just to get to the front of the line. But number two, you do have the responsibility to represent your own, whether it's women, blacks, Native Americans, Asians, whatever. But then it's also a teaching moment, okay? That responsibility comes. And I think, you know, what we saw last night, you know, with Kamala Harris was, you, you know, her washing herself into that teaching moment, you know? And letting those groups that may have questions if only because they're unfamiliar with this person you know letting that group know hey i'm okay i probably know more about you than you know about me so i'm going to tell you some things about me and you know what if she's elected and again i come back you know like black about michelle when they go to the white house if, if we're elected you'll get to see more of us and you know what we're going to probably teach you a lot more than you, you can teach us because we already know about you and so I, I, I think it's a, it was a great moment for her last night. And yes, she's going to be scrutinized because she's new and because she carries the dreams and aspirations of so many. And I'm talking about the minority, but at the same time, she has to talk to the status quo. That was the point I was trying to make. And so, Zach, it may be unfair, but it's part of the burden of being among the first. You know what? Maybe five years from now, 10 years from now, we won't think it's such a big deal to have a woman as vice president or president. But for right now, where we are, she's on. Uh, she's in untreaded waters. So far, she's doing pretty good. They will be watching everything she does and says. Probably more so than Joe Biden, because we know. And when you think about President Obama, dial back uh, early in his administration, when there was the uh, uh, the police arrested the Harvard scholar Henry Louis Gates in his own home, and President Obama objected to that, and there was blowback 
for objecting to the fact that somebody was arrested in his own home. Um, or when Trayvon Martin was killed and Barack Obama said, if I had a son, this is what I would be afraid of. And he got blowback for something that would just seem like a normal parent thing to say as President of the United States. So, I, you know, the, the problem is, Zach, you are 100% right. But how do you then play those real politics within those real limitations? And that's sort of the poignant an almost sad tragedy of this moment that people have to be able to deal with in those limitations, even if those limitations are flat out wrong and flat out unjust and unjustifiable, but they exist. Barack Obama delivering the State of the Union address and the congressman says to him, you lie. It's never, ever happened before. It hasn't happened since. Uh, no, the first, you're, you're going you're gonna to take a beating, but, but you do it well, persevere, move on, and you open the doors, you know, for everybody else. If, if, if not for Barack Obama, we're not, we might not be talking about Kamala Harris. All right, Manuel, I think you were next. Uh, I think I'm Rutha was before okay. me, actually. All right, I'm Rutha. I wanted to touch on a few things. First, as a black woman, as a South Asian woman, Kamala Harris had so many things that she had to fight up against going onto that stage. And I think that she really felt the weight of history on her shoulders. And I think she was still able to navigate such a hard situation very masterfully. But I wanted to touch on specifically a few things that happened during the debate. I think it was Maddie M. who mentioned earlier about the question about Roe v. Wade. I thought it was very, very interesting how Mike Pence pivoted right away from talking about abortion at first because he really did not want any of their suburban women voters to hear him say that he is not for abortion. I don't think it's a secret that Pence is pro-life. I don't think it's a secret that the Republican Party is pro-life. I think they're trying to make sure that that is not at the forefront of the argument because they're trying to court white women and suburban women so i while i don't think you know he ultimately ended up having to say that he was pro-life i think it was a very interesting pivot he pivoted away from every single question but i thought that one was extremely notable and the other thing that i wanted to touch on from the vp debate is that the word that was said the most throughout the entire debate was fracking and fracking came up so 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 many times and i think it did a lot of damage on a lot of sides. One, the Trump campaign keeps saying that Joe Biden's gonna ban all fracking, which then the Biden campaign has to unequivocally state that he is not going to do that, which then pushes away people on the left, especially young people who really strongly oppose fracking and think it's terrible for the environment. The number of times that she has to state that, more people get upset on the left because it's so bad for the environment. But they're also very clearly trying to get people in states like Pennsylvania who rely on fracking for their jobs. And then finally, I'll keep this part short because I know we've talked about this a lot. I just wanted to make extra clear what the role of sexism was in the debate. It wasn't necessarily in the words that Mike Pence said or in you know any specific topic or conversation, but the role of sexism had a seat at the debate. It was how she had to prepare for it. It was how we are talking about it now. It was how she is going to be covered from here on out. So while sexism may not have been anything Mike Pence specifically said to her, anything that the moderator specifically said to her, it is everywhere in that debate because it isn't just about direct drags. It isn't just about direct things said to Senator Harris. It's about the way she was treated before, the way she's going to be treated after, and the way that every woman has had to deal with sexism in this country. Yeah, I think that's a very, very perceptive and, and powerful comment. Sexism had a seat at that debate, regardless of whether it was sitting there physically or not. Um, I also agree that fracking is sort of a double-edged sword, uh, and I think that's why Mike Pence kept bringing it up um, on that issue. And I would like somebody in a debate to ask a question, not about what you would support in your home state of Indiana or California about abortion if Roe is overturned, but ask somebody if they support overturning Roe and if they support 
um, states making abortion illegal, as many states will do if Roe is overturned, would they be comfortable uh, with, those, with laws that could potentially put doctors, nurses, and women in jail for obtaining an abortion? I would like this to get away from the legal and talk about it in the actual personal uh, uh, consequence of what these laws might actually do. Um, and I, I'm very frustrated with moderators who don't push the issues in terms of actual consequence on all of this. And I think that's the reason why Mike Pence was able to evade that question, because those questions are never put hard enough and specific enough for people to, to force some of these candidates to answer the consequences of what they say they believe in. You know, that's a challenge. I think you're absolutely right. And you know why reporters don't ask that question, moderators don't ask that kind of question, Lenny? Because they don't want the blowback. With all due respect, and I'm talking generally, not about anybody specifically, they don't want the blowback. They don't want the criticism. They don't want to be accused, you know, by the other side of favoring one candidate or the other. So you play it safe. And uh, I think a lot of what we're hearing here is that too many times in the media, we play it safe. Uh, especially early on in the administration. I, I think there was almost too much respect for the office. Uh, uh, you know, we had to learn to take the gloves off. We play it safe. I totally agree with you. I, I, I want the kind of questions that, the kind of questions that are going to leave the viewers and the people tuning in knowing something more about the candidate. What makes them tick? What will they fight for? And I think too often we are just trying to be too polite. Uh, in these debates. They're not really debates, they're talking points, they're presentations, that sort of thing. And on the flip side, Bruce, um, you know, Roe v. Wade basically set up a situation of trimesters in which it basically said it, a woman in the first trimester and second trimester gets the benefit of all the doubt on making that decision, but the state then has an interest in potentially putting in more regulations in the third trimester. That's Roe. If you read Roe, that's it. So I think an equally fair question for, let's say, Senator Harris would be, would you support abortion on demand without restrictions up until the time of birth? And see how she wrestles with that. Again, this is also a lack of knowledge among some of these reporters for asking the questions about how policy makes its way into consequences and the decisions that people have to make. And that's where I'm disappointed, is I think, yes, yeah, Susan Page did a perfectly good job, but I think she missed opportunities to really drive home the end result of a lot of what some of these folks are saying and make them wrestle with it and stick them to it and don't let them evade or, or deflect, as a, a word somebody used earlier. I think, Manuel, you were next. Yeah, um, I think it's important to bring up uh, the goals that they were both they both had going into the debate, they had two very different goals, you know, the instability of Donald Trump's presidency and the performance and the chaos that he brought to the first debate made Mike Pence have to stabilize the ticket. And then for Kamala, with Biden being the transition candidate and with the narrative that he's pushed, she had to present herself to the nation as a future prospective uh, president. So they had very different goals, but in strategy, I thought they were very similar. I thought neither of them was particularly good in answering questions directly. They both were very good at pivoting. For Mike Pence, it was whenever he was asked a question, he usually pivoted back to fracking or back to taxes. For Kamala, when she was asked the question that she didn't particularly want to answer, she pivoted to the Affordable Care Act. So even though they had two very different goals, I thought they used very similar strategies. Now, as for the role that sexism played in the debate, I think that we have to remember that Kamala went on that stage in the aftermath of Hillary Clinton in 2016. Um, and I would like to believe that the media and people overall learned their lesson in the way Hillary Clinton was covered in 2016. There was a lot of focus on how she dressed. She didn't smile enough. She smelled too much. And I agree with Bruce that, yeah, there were times that Kamala's smiling seemed too inappropriate. But I think that focusing on that particular part of the debate lends itself for losing the substance of what it is that she was saying. And I think that one of her strongest uh, points or strongest uh, 
takeaways from the debate was that she was allowed to push the messages and get the points out there that Biden was not allowed to in the first debate due to Trump's uh, constant interrupting. And as for how she related to Gen Z, there was one big takeaway from that debate, and it was very minimal. I don't think she even spent more than 15 seconds on it. But there was a moment where she looked at the camera and she said, there are people in their 20s who are concerned that they will graduate high school, they will graduate college, and they will not get a job. Personally, as a Gen Zer, I know that that speaks to a lot of us. I know that a lot of us are concerned that we are not going to get our return on investment in our college degree. So the fact that she just looked at the camera and acknowledged that, I know is really going to stick with a lot of people in our generation. So I think you're right. I think they each had different goals going in. Ultimately, uh, Harris wanted to introduce herself to the American people. Uh, Mike Pence had an audience of one as much as anything else which was to defend the president and to, and to make the president seem better. Uh, they each wanted to poke holes in the other's argument. Um, they did that to some extent, but I don't think there was any sort of serious loss on either part. But I do notice in some of the uh, uh, chat here, and I think Andrea brought this up, isn't it interesting how uh, Senator Harris is constantly referred to by her first name? Whereas nobody goes and talks about the vice president or Pence as Mike. Um, and uh, it, it's, you know, everyone was Hillary in 2016, but it wasn't Donald in 2016. Um, it, was, uh, it was Geraldine in 1984, uh, but it wasn't uh, George H.W. Uh, Bush in 1984. Interesting how that plays out in that subtle form of, uh, uh, as, as um, uh, Amrutha said, sexism uh, or gender was sitting at that table uh, throughout the debate. Uh, who is next? Anyone up? So let me, before you, uh, Dan, before I get to you, I'm just going to pop this up and just uh, finally just show a couple other things here, which is, Um, there was an exchange on COVID. Um, uh, Harris uh, uh, took, uh, uh, hit Pence and Trump pretty hard, basically saying that Mike Pence and Donald Trump knew about the nature of that pandemic on January 28th, didn't say a word about it. And she said, um, you know, the American people have had to sacrifice far too much because of the incompetence of this administration. Mike Pence tried to say that Donald Trump has put the health of America first um, and that uh, the Biden plan is really no different from what President Trump has been doing. So why are essentially you making a big deal out of it? And why is Joe Biden plagiarizing as he's done before in his past? There were notable quotes um, uh, on foreign policy. Uh, Senator Harris, what we've seen with Donald Trump is that he has betrayed our friends and embraced dictators around the world. Trump prefers to take the word of Vladimir Putin over the word of the American intelligence community. Mike Pence on climate change, he's saying that um, we're going to listen to science and that we don't need a massive $2 trillion Green New Deal. Uh, Harris, uh, you know, basically, you know, they don't believe in science. And then the whole issue related to taxes and the exchange there. So bottom line, did we learn anything? And will it change any mind? So is this just going to be a nothing burger that we can talk about um, in our political class, but it's not going to make a difference? Or does this have any impact at all on the election? So Dan, you want to uh, uh, take that? No, nope, you're done. All right. Actually, Robin is next. Oh, OK. Robin, go for it. Yeah, I'll, I'll go. Um, thanks, Dan. Um, the thing that I found so irritating about yesterday's debate was I felt like there were so many topic points that they were trying to get to. Um, there was nine of them opposed to six in the last one. And so by the time that the candidate, well, what they did was they divided their two minutes. The first minute was them using it as a rebuttal to what their opponent had said beforehand. And then the second minute when it was time for them to like address the actual question at hand, um, they, they, uh, by the time that they made a point, they were being cut off again. And I found that to be very frustrating because 
you know, I was trying to listen to what they were saying, but they were talking about the point made before and trying to defend, like, their candidate that they're supporting. And so I felt like I learned more from the last debate. However, it was it was difficult to, um, because it, fe- it felt like as soon as they were making a, a good point about whatever issue that they were talking about, they were being cut off again. And then that's when those moments of, um, uh, especially when um, Senator Harris is speaking, um, uh, Pence would cut her off. That's what made it more frustrating because, like, as soon as she was trying to make a point, she was being cut off again. And her saying, you know, I'm speaking is such a valid point because, um, you know, as a, as a woman, when you're trying to make a point in a situation where there is sexism at hand um, and you're trying to say something and you're being cut off, it is so frustrating. And I was talking to a friend about this, and and, um, they're like, oh, she's so condescending. And I was just like, why? Because she's following the debate rules and that she is, that they both agreed on that their times would be divided and that two minutes was her time, two minutes was his time. She was following the rules. That's condescending. And I just thought it was ridiculous. I mean, they're literally, she is following the rules that they both agreed upon, but she is, is, considered rude for saying I'm speaking it, it, it was ridiculous um I would I hope going forward that they will a lot I hope that both candidates learn like hey let's get to the point faster before we're cut off but I don't know I just noticed it a lot more yesterday and maybe it's because it was a woman a, a woman against another of uh, against a man instead of two men speaking but I just found that to be very frustrating and I think that's partly our responsibility and the media's responsibility that we allow optics and highlights to dominate the discussion rather than the substance of what they say and the consequences of their policies as they may articulate them. And I, yeah, I think that, you know, look, let's be clear. Um, what we were chatting about what before class with uh, what was on Mike Pence's hair? The fly. The fly. We were That's talking. That's gonna dominate. I, you know, we're talking about all this other stuff and all this substance and how, you know, Harris looked well, and how she was strong at everything. But, you know, we what what do we remember from the debate last week? We remember that it was a mess, and the Proud Boys line because there was a spectacle about it. A week from now, we're not gonna remember anything that was said in this debate we're going to remember that fly sitting atop mike pence's head and we're going to remember it every time we see mike pence from here on out because it was this little black bug in this snow white hair and the optics of it looked horrible especially for how long it was there and that's what the american people are going to take away from this debate not you know any we we might you know today the aftermath is still you know, how Harris held her own, the I'm speaking stuff, but we're going to remember that fly. That is the takeaway from this debate, and that's the only thing that's going to matter down the road. Yeah, and as I've mentioned from the 1960 debate, people on television saw that debate differently from the people who heard it on radio because of Nixon's fidgeting and discomfort and the sweat pouring down his face, which was gooping up the shave stick he tried to use to cover up his beard. Um, That's what we remember. We don't remember the content of what they actually said. And in fact, their opening statements, I think, were eight minutes compared to the two minutes we allow today. So I think to some extent, you know, uh, the fault, dear Brutus, is not in the stars. It's in ourselves. And, uh, uh, And it's in ourselves because of how we process this information and what we remember and therefore how little we demand of these candidates that they answer these questions because they game out the optics and they game out how they want the public to be able to interpret a debate like this rather than anything substantive that they're going to say. So I think, yeah, again, it's unfortunate. And not just the fly, but the pink eye is another conversation people are having. So you may be right. The fly may become the dominant storyline of that debate, but is anybody going to remember any of the sort of substantive answers? My guess, probably not. And that's why maybe Robin is right that the previous debate was more sort of basically honest in terms of how these spectacles take place because there was barely no substance. It was just conflict. It was just optics. 
it was just the opportunity for everybody to talk about the, you know, the back and forth and the disagreement and the interruptions and the TV show aspect of it rather than any substance that was there. After debates, reporters typically ask, how did they perform? Not necessarily, what did they have to say? And I think, again, that fault is on us for not demanding more. So who's up there? I think, Andriana, uh, you had something here. Yeah, so um, I agree with what you're saying that um, you asked earlier, you know, are we going to, did we learn anything from this debate? Like, are we going to have any takeaways? And I agree that the main takeaways we're going to have are pink eye and the fly. Um, Jenna mentioned last night that the two trending topics on Twitter were, I think it was like Pence pink eye or something and the fly. Um, and I think social media chatter and honestly memes um, on social media have a lot more um, give a lot more insight to what people take away from certain events and to what the impact on society certain events will have than I think older generations give them credit for. Um, after the last debate, which I think is actually, despite the fact it was arguably a worse debate than this one, will have a larger impact um, than the vice presidential debate. Um, but if you look at the memes and the social media title from the last debate, it was about the mess it was, the chaos, about the frustration people felt um, with Donald Trump's interruptions and um, his um, irresponsibility in the debate, Joe Biden's Will You Shut Up Man, and the Proud Boys. Um, and those are still the things we're talking about today, um, even though there was probably a lot more to unpack in that debate um, than just those subjects. And the same with the vice presidential debate. I think, you know, both candidates had some really good moments. I think there's a lot to talk about in terms of Senator Harris's um, performance and how she dealt with the standards that we talked about. I think there's a lot to talk about in Mike Pence's contrast to Donald Trump and how he's almost the polar opposite of the president. But no one cares about that. Honestly, they just care that there's a fly on Pence's head and that he looks like he had pink eye. Um, and I don't think that it's gonna change anyone's mind. I think that it was entertainment. It was just a reminder that we do have a semblance of professionalism left in American politics, that there's some sort of facade of that there. Um, but I think if you ask Republicans who won, they'd say Pence. If you ask Democrats who won, they'd say Harris. And if you asked anyone a week from now to quote something, they wouldn't be able to do anything except talk about the fly and the pink guy. Um, so I just think that in itself gives a large insight into where we are in the election right now and the roles the VP candidates are going to play. Um, and I think just honestly, if you ask me, Mike Pence lost the debate just because he had the fly and the pink guy. Like those are two of optic gloves that we talked about that he's not gonna be able to recover from. No one cares what he said at all during the two minutes the fly was on his head. I don't remember a single thing he said. I was cracking up in my living room. So, and I think that reflects a lot of the rest of the population. And I think people will remember Mr. Vice President, I'm speaking, I'm speaking. Now, I will say this, I'm not so sure, with all due respect, Bruce, uh, television is the best medium for substantive dialogue. John Kennedy, I think it was 1959, wrote an article in TV Guide basically saying that television would become the most powerful force in politics because it will reveal something about politicians that no other medium is capable of revealing. And we may not be looking for television to uh, interpret what their policies are, but we do look at it as a potential window into people's character. And that's why last week's debate may have had such an impact and why the I'm speaking, I'm speaking may have such an impact because it says something about character rather than consequence of policy. So in that sense, yes, it's valuable, but in the long run, and character is important, don't get me wrong, Lyndon Johnson's character, I think, got us into the Vietnam War. Jimmy Carter's character created for what many believe to be a feckless presidency. Bill Clinton's character is what got him into trouble in the 1990s when he was president. Same with George W. Bush and certainly Donald Trump. Um, character is important, but so are policies. So I do think TV has a tendency to enable us to gain some insight into that character, even if it doesn't give us insight into policies. And that's why we will remember the things we are talking about here, because we want that window into who that person is that we will be having sitting in the Oval Office over those next four years. So Stephanie and Zach. 
yeah, what we were talking about at the beginning of class as well, and how um, is this why going to be the legacy of this debate, which it very might well just might be. Um, the fact that the Biden campaign played into it so heavily also led to its prominence. The fact that they turned around right away and now not only sold, but sold out of fly swatters. Um, they didn't play like the most crucial role, but that also they're guiding people's minds as well of being like, let's remember this rather than what we talked about. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, again, you're right. Biden campaign, very smart to seize on that because A, as with what Andriana said, they know that this is what people will take away and B, they're going to exploit it and, uh, and do everything they can with it. Remember when Hillary Clinton used the phrase deplorables, that became a marketing tool for the Trump campaign in 2016. They noticed it, they seized on it, they sold merchandise on it, Biden campaign was very, very smart on that because in politics, you have to pick up on everything and try and seize that opportunity and make the most of it. Zach? Um, and I think to the point that everyone's making, um, I think that we're just witnessing how emotionally driven our elections are to this day, that there's not really much of a standard when it comes to, you know, what? politicians need to say to get elected, but really just about the feelings that need to be invoked in order for people to really, you know, basically keep your name in their mouth. And I think that that is, honestly, I want to say that it's, you know, something that we can always have understood in American politics, but I think a bigger issue is, is that that is the impact of Trump, um, because he himself is such this big personality. And right now, we're watching our politics almost play out like a comic book. Like, he's the big bad villain, and we're just looking for this other hero archetype that's going to come in and take away all of our problems under Trump. And I think that that is becoming, um, I think the Democrats are leaning into that in a way that is kind of maybe working for them, but I'm scared that it's going to be utilized too much um, to someone's detriment. And I think that while we're saying, you know, Kamala's biggest line was, I'm speaking, I'm speaking, um, she also had a lot of key attacks that I think um, for climate change activists, for people on the left who uh, have a big investment in that particular policy issue, she actually, I think, had some stronger points um, on that, even though she really lost it when she started talking about fracking. Um, I mean, she pointed out that Donald Trump and Mike Pence their, the administration hasn't really um, acknowledged a lot of the climate science that's happened, um, that they took down key information off of the um, Environmental Protection Agency's uh, website about climate change. I think that, you know, right now, um, whether or not you're a high engaged voter or a low engaged voter, you are feeling the impact of misinformation and disinformation, and you're feeling disillusioned by it. And I think that, um, Democrats right now, the best thing that they can do is be a voice to help muddle through that disillusionment. And I think that that, for me, was one of the bigger takeaways from the debate, which is that whether or not you think Kamala is a strong politician or whether or not you think that she's the right fit, she is sticking to the facts. And that is something we've lost sight of. And I think that may be a good way to close. Uh, I'm going to say a couple words. I'll let uh, Bruce say a couple words. But I think you make a really important point about how emotionally driven politics uh, is right now. And because it's so emotional, it allows misinformation, as you say, and disinformation to enter into our political bloodstream unnoticed or unchecked because people are reacting solely in an emotional way. And I think that emotional side of politics is really become magnified in this day and age. I don't know if I mentioned this in an earlier class, but um, I trace back the emotional relationship we have with our presidents all the way back to the 19th century when the first close-up photograph of a president took place. We could look into Abraham Lincoln's face and read emotion into it, read what we want into it. It ceased to be 
a civic relationship with the president and increasingly became an emotional relationship with the president. And television in particular is a very emotional medium. It's a medium that evokes certain things in us through the images that we see that we are not always conscious of. And so we pick up on certain shortcuts and heuristics and cues that feed or confirm our biases or our preferences, and that's fundamentally emotional, but that has a real downside because that emotional relationship with politics is if it's increasingly divorced from our civic relationship, allows all of this bad and ugly stuff, this misinformation, this disinformation to enter into our uh, body politic. And to me, that is a danger for the years ahead if it does go unchecked. So very, very good point. Bruce, I'm gonna see you have any final words and then we better close up because we're out of time. Right, Bruce, you're on mute. Bruce, you're on mute. Thanks. Um, as long as my final words aren't going to be taken as my most important words, because they're not. But, you know, I was thinking as we were talking, a um, long time ago I was on jury duty. And so that was my first chance of getting in to see what, you know, being tried, you know, by a jury of the peers, what it means and everything. And I came out of there really frightened because my thing was, if these are jurors of my peers, I'm in trouble. Uh, because we let a guy off that I, I, I was just convinced was guilty. I felt all the evidence said that he was guilty. My, my point being, um, I don't have probably the confidence in the typical voter that most people have. And, and I think that's because in my job, I get to get out and meet people and talk to people uh, about what's really important to them, what's not. And just as important, what they know about issues. You guys are really bright. You know all the issues. You don't rely on television. You know, you do your research. A lot of people don't. I mean, I'm going to venture to say probably most people don't. And maybe we'll make their decision based on a television debate. That kind of stuff is really scary to me. It's like being in that jury room. But it is what it is. It's what we have. This television thing. And everybody's watching the debates. I mean, wasn't there a record number of people that saw you know, President Trump, you know, and uh, Joe Biden. So whether you, you get it on your computer screen, your phone, or, you know, paying all that money for cable, you're going to watch because it's a piece of it. It's the visual. And how somebody performs under pressure and you say what you need to say quickly because that's the way we think now and process things quickly, that's important. But it's just a small piece of, of what you go into um, uh, you know, your, your vote. I think Donald Trump changed a lot of things. Um, uh, and you're right. Um, you know, I think exactly somebody mentioned, you know, The Apprentice. I mean, the, the guy was made in television. I, I mean, he understood it more so than anybody. He just mowed down his Republican opponent. So television's not going to go anywhere. As a matter of fact, the candidates, you know, they're being prepped and told, you got to be better at this. Don't, don't, don't think you can bypass this and just start talking uh talking points you know and programs and policies now if they want your policies tell them where to go find that stuff give them a link that's not what television's for it's for something totally different so we're going to be there uh, we can be better of course lenny as you say in terms of the questions but truth of the matter is i mean come on the moderator is not doing anything but you know doling out questions they're not controlling anything you're not gonna tell the vice president to be quiet they're not going to give us capability of cutting off their mics which you Got the president's mic off. So that's not going to happen. You know, uh, it's not going to be virtual. You know, Donald Trump has already said, President Trump's already said, they're going to take part in a virtual you know, debate because that's a big part of what he does, cutting people off, talking over people. And so only God knows where this is going to go. Again, I go back to, I think most of the die has been cast. People have decided a lot of votes are already on the way. But it's just incredible, just like this class. This, this is the wave of the future. You know, we may never have to, you know, go into a, a classroom again. You can do this for, you know, with your from home and that sort of thing. Lenny, you don't have to dress up, wear a tie, you know, whatever. This is all fine, but I think this election is is, is, is the tipping point. Uh, I, I don't think we'll ever go back to where we were in 2016. I, I, I think there will be some balance at this point. I think people have, have really awakened those who set out the last election, you know, presidential election, kind of realized, hey, you can't sleep on this stuff. 
I think people that have just voted the way their parents have voted, the way they're expected to vote it, they realize now elections have consequences. And I think that's what you guys are talking about here. So I, I, I'm anxious to see where this goes. I, I'm really anxious to see where it goes. I think the big story is going to be uh, turnouts. I think the big story is going to be what Donald Trump does when he loses. And I don't care how he loses. It's what he does, how he responds. And I think that's going to be a story that's going to go on for days and days. And days. I know I'm talking like, you know, you know, we're voting tomorrow. But, again, go back to what I said initially. We still got plenty of time for surprises. I, you know, I, I don't think the surprise is over. I think the election's over. I don't think the surprises are over. And uh, so, so keep, keep, keep you know, you stand a therapist, keep the therapist on speed dial. You know, I mean, this this is not over. Uh, I, I, I think we're, we're ready for, for some more breaking news stuff. Well, in, uh, th all, yeah. in three weeks, we will be doing our electoral college map as a class, making our prediction as to whether this election is over. And um, but I will say this, that um, whoever wins this year, let's say it's Joe Biden, and let's say the economy doesn't recover quickly, um, you will be in for a fireworks election in 2024. Uh, and uh, so I don't think the intensity is going to end. Uh, I just think that it may well be that the Trump presidency could end. So we'll have to see. Um, and anyway, we are out of time. Thank you, everybody, for just incredible thoughts and insights and comments. Uh, and uh, to the WSA viewers, uh, thank you for joining us. And we will all see you in a week. And uh, everyone, rest up. Another busy week ahead. So thanks so much, and see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.